The Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School convened a gathering in March 2017 titled Taking Our Meds Faithfully, Christian Engagements with Psychiatric Medication, supported by the McDonald Agape Foundation. We invite you to join us for some of these conversations. I'm Brent McCarty. I'm a doctoral candidate in theological ethics here at Duke Divinity School, and I work closely with the Theology, Medicine, Culture Initiative. And it's my great joy today to be joined by Dr. Ryan Lawrence, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center. And uh, Ryan also practices uh, psychiatry at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Thank you for being with us. Today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great, great. Well, so you're a psychiatrist who also has a Master's of Divinity, mm -hmm. uh, and you work in an academic psych psychiatric context. Um, given that, what does it mean to care for folks? I think it, in a concrete sense, the care ends up being very similar whether someone has a religious background or non-religious background. I think the biggest difference is the motivation behind it. Some of these patients are very difficult to work with. Some of them are very easy to work with, but there's a whole range. And, and some patients are very rewarding, some patients it's more of a challenge, especially if they're in the throes of a, of a mental illness. I, I think one of, the, one of the important aspects is, uh, as a religious person, with a theological background, it provides me with, with motivation to do the work that I do. It also connects me with a really long history of, of very thoughtful people who have um, for, the, for many generations, hundreds of years, have thought about what does it mean to, to care for the sick? What does it mean to, to minister to them in their time of need? And so that's one of the benefits, I think, of, of, of thinking through both lenses. That's great. Um, what are some of the ways that you see moral and theological questions informing how psychiatrists think and, uh, and approach their own work? Again, I, I think it has a lot to do with why does a person do what they do? What's motivating them? Certainly the, the Bible is full of, of examples of, of great acts of love, great acts of kindness and charity. And so I, I think that's something that comes up on a daily basis for someone, like in my situation, I do inpatient psychiatry. So people who are at their sickest, many of them. And what motivates me to do that, uh, there, there are great examples in the, in the scriptures that, that are powerful motivators. Great, great, thanks. So for this conference, you wrote, wrote uh, two papers, uh, one on the kind of empirical background for antidepressant use in the United States, and the other doing the same for stimulant use. Um, I, I'd like to talk about antidepressants first. Um, could you give us a bit of an overview of the rates and demographics of depression, of psychopharmacological treatment, and of visits with the doctor? Sure, I'll throw some numbers at you. Yeah. Um, right now, some, uh, based on the evidence we have, roughly 8% of the adult population is currently depressed. That's right now. If you expand that to the last 12 months, it's about 10% is currently depressed. Roughly one in five adults will experience a major depressive episode at some point in their lifetime. These are very common conditions that, that don't always get talked about. Sometimes when a person is, with, is depressed, they'll withdraw from community activities, and uh, sometimes they'll want to keep it a secret that they've suffered from a, a major depressive episode. So it doesn't always get noticed, but when you see the, the numbers, these are very common conditions that, that really should be part of the public dialogue. In terms of treatment, um, roughly 13% of adults are currently using an antidepressant. Now many of them, thankfully, are not currently depressed. A lot of them, it's, it's, uh, they, they've suffered depression in the past, and they've been treated, and they're protecting themselves from future episodes of depression. But 13% is a pretty high number of people who are currently using antidepressants. That's really helpful. Could, could you maybe say a bit about the kind of demographics around um, depression and antidepressant use as well? Sure. Depression does vary from, uh, from different racial and ethnic categories. It tends to be a little bit more prominent or prevalent in uh, the white population. And that's statistically significant when you compare that with non-white groups. Uh, non-white groups, depending on the group, it varies from anywhere from 5 to 10% of, 
of people in those groups are experiencing depression. In terms of a depression treatment, one of the big problems in depression treatment is there are a lot of people who are experiencing depression who are not getting treatment for depression. Either they have no treatment or the treatment they're getting is not adequate treatment. And there, the non-white population has higher rates of non-treatment and, and of not getting adequate treatment. So it's a problem for really for all racial and ethnic groups. Depending on the group, the problem, the specific problem, might look a little bit different. But, but this is a, a, a situation that all of these groups are struggling with in some form. That's really helpful to know. And how, how about gender? Uh, depression tends to be a bit more prevalent among women than among men. I don't have the exact numbers in my head. Could you say a bit about the helpfulness of different forms of treatment for depression, um, whether psychopharmacological, psychotherapy, or some combination of the two? Sure. When someone comes to a psychiatrist to so get treated for depression, they'll usually be either prescribed a medication or referred for psychotherapy, or maybe the psychiatrist will do the psychotherapy herself or himself. Or there's a combination approach. And the evidence suggests that the combination approach works the best for depression. There's some MRI uh, literature looking at how medications and how psychotherapy affect the brain. It turns out that both antidepressant medications and uh, psychotherapy have measurable MRI effects on the brain. But they affect different parts of the brain. And this is one explanation, possible explanation, for why these treatments work synergistically and why the combination can be so much more powerful than one or the other. So what are some maybe common cultural myths about depression and antidepressant use that you think it would be important to dispel? Some that I hear all the time. There are people who are afraid that they'll get addicted to an antidepressant. And there are certainly some medications that have addiction potential, but antidepressants really don't fall into those categories. There's, there's, uh, there's really no abuse potential. People don't get high off of these medications. There's no physiological dependence on these medications. For some of them, you have to be careful how rapidly you start them and stop them, but, but it's not an addiction in the, in the classic sense. So that's one thing I hear. Another thing that I've run into is people are afraid that if they start an antidepressant, that the dose will keep going up, that the psychiatrist will have to add more and more medication. And, and there's a fear that if they start antidepressant treatment, then that sets them on a pathway of more and more medication, and they don't want to be on that pathway. They'd rather get through this on their own. And I think that's a myth, too. I think uh, probably what's going on is the person is, is suffering from a real biological depression. And, and for some of these people who wind up having multiple treatments added, their depression is just really that severe. And it's, it's not that the medication is causing that depression to worsen. If anything, the, the, the antidepressants might be preventing the depression from, from being as bad as it might otherwise be. I've certainly seen a lot of patients who start a medication, they feel like it's not working, so they stop the medication and the depression gets profoundly worse. So those, those are certainly two myths that I run into. The idea that you'll get addicted to the antidepressant or the idea that it will make your depression worse. That's helpful, thank you. Um, so as someone with theological training who practices psychiatry, um, what are some important things you think we should consider about antidepressant use moving forward? The message that I want to communicate every time I get a chance to talk with clergy or with people at, at various congregations, I always try and communicate that depression is a real biological condition. Sometimes there are people who believe that through prayer they can prevent or escape from depression or through taking better care of themselves. There's this idea that it's their fault that they're depressed, and if they, they change their behaviors or reach out for more spiritual help, that it, it will resolve the depression. Sometimes they do those things, and it is helpful for depression. And, and for those people, you know, God bless them. There are really other people who, for whom the depression is, is really a biological condition. We know that depressive episodes can run in families. Uh, we, we know that you know, with twin studies, we, we know that there, there's a hereditary vulnerability to depression that can get passed on to generation to generation. We know that certainly there are a lot of uh, chemicals, drugs, substances of abuse that can trigger depression. Uh, so, so we know that depression is a real biological phenomenon. In biblical terms, I would uh, place it under the category of just the fallen nature of, of humanity. We don't have perfect bodies. We don't have perfect brains. 
illness comes in many forms. And so that, that's a message that I always try to communicate is this is a real medical condition. And we have treatments for it. They're not perfect treatments, but uh, th that's always something that I want to communicate. And, and I feel like maybe I'm in a special position to do that as someone with both medical training and theological training because I'm familiar with both worlds and I'm kind of an insider in both worlds. So I always look for an opportunity to, to, to promote that idea. Uh, one of the things we know from depression research is there are a lot of people who suffer from depression who don't want to see a psychiatrist. Many of those people, they would be willing to talk with their clergy or to talk to, to people in their religious community. And I think that creates a special position for clergy, for ministers of all sorts, for uh, religious leaders, lay leaders, to be on the lookout for depression. And to, it's important to learn about depression, to know some of the signs and symptoms of depression, because there are people who will turn to them for help when they won't turn to anyone else for help. So that's another important message. Turning to the use of stimulants, could you give us a bit of an overview of the rates and demographics of psychopharmacological treatments with stimulants? Sure. Starting off with the rates of ADHD in society, um, approximately 8% of, of children and young people uh, suffer from ADHD. And uh, those rates are a little bit lower among adults, more like 4 or 4.5% of adults suffer from ADHD. So that translates into maybe 1 in 10 children and 1 in 20 adults have ADHD. Among children, uh, about half of them take stimulants for ADHD. So in terms of the whole population, it's about 4%, again, 1 in 20. So it's certainly enough so you get one child per classroom in most schools. And for some schools, it might, the, uh, they might even have multiple children in the classroom. So it's the type of thing that, that everyone runs into, this idea that some people have difficulty focusing and some people get treatment for it. In terms of the treatments, stimulants are the primary medication that's used. For children, roughly half of the children with ADHD use stimulants for ADHD. It translates into about 4%, 4.5% for the population. Among adults, stimulant use is much lower. Roughly 10% of adults with ADHD take stimulants for the ADHD. The rest have just figured out other ways of, of adapting to their condition. Stimulant use has been on the rise. When you look at prescription rates among children back in the 80s, it was very low, like 0.6%. More recent numbers from the 2000s put the estimates around three, between 3 and 4% of children get prescriptions for, for stimulants. That's, that's not huge in terms of absolute numbers, but that's a huge jump when you compare the, the, the two different decades. So th these, these prescriptions are certainly out there. And it's something that people are starting to notice and are wondering, what's going on? Why are so many young people and adults taking stimulants? And are there differences among demographics like race and gender about uh, stimulant use? There are. For, uh, these numbers are for children and adolescents. <clears throat> stimulant use is more common among whites than among non-whites. It's more common among people with insurance compared to people without insurance. It's more common for people who use public insurance compared to people who use private insurance. And I thought this was interesting. The, the numbers change a bit depending on which region of the country people are in. The rates seem to be highest in the Northeast when you compare it with people in the West. So it seems like it's unlikely that ADHD is distributed geographically um, in, in uneven ways. So it's very interesting that this treatment is distributed unevenly when you look across the country. So as you mentioned, we've seen a large rise in stimulant use, uh, particularly among high schoolers and undergraduates. And yet, in your paper, you say that in the medical literature, stimulants are shown to not be effective in improving academic performance long term. Mm -hmm. How do you square these two things? This is a very complicated question that is still trying to be sorted out in the literature. It is true that when you take ADHD rating scales and uh, compare students on stimulants with, with ADHD students who are not on stimulants, uh, the, the stimulants really do help these ADHD symptoms get better. So that in that sense, these medications work. But when you look at other goals, uh, performance on standardized tests, college graduation rates, 
they don't seem to have much of an impact, at least nowhere near the impact that you would hope, but it, it doesn't even seem to be a statistically significant impact. I think what that means is there's a whole lot more to achievement than, uh, than what's on the table when we're talking just ADHD and stimulants. It, it has a lot to do with, um, for example, students with uh, people with ADHD, they're more vulnerable to having other mental health conditions, depression being one of them, substance abuse being another one, anxiety is also common. And, and that's going to affect your performance. Um, people who take medication who have this diagnosis we don't know what that means in terms of their development. Someone who goes through life carrying this diagnosis, it has to have some meaning for them as they, as they face life struggles, as they grow up with this label on them. And does that have anything to do with long-term performance? We really don't know. Just to follow up on that, I think that there, I mean, there seems to be this myth that like success, however it's defined in academic or professional terms, uh, the focus necessary for success could come through stimulant use. And yet, um, you're, at least of what I hear you saying, is that perhaps in the short term, but there are much more complicated factors in the long term uh, for, uh, for that type of achievement. Success, I mean, yeah. who can define yeah, right. what success means? ADHD is just one small slice of a person's experience in the world. And uh, it, it, there, there are other things that matter also, emotional intelligence, resilience, opportunities coming your way. Um, success is, is so very complicated. I think there's possibly a, a, a wish that we could boil it down to something simple like taking a pill or not taking a pill. We all wish there were a smart pill that we could take. I'd take it. I'm sure most people would. Um, but, but life is just so much more complicated than that. And I think that's probably a big part of, of why, uh, why we don't see the, the correlation that we wish we would see between using a stimulant and uh, and, and having higher achievement in some of these broader goals. Some other things about stimulants. Um, it's really unclear whether stimulants have much of a benefit for non-ADHD people. It'll help you stay awake. It might help you focus a little bit more. But, but there's, there's really not good evidence that it improves test scores even. I mean, at most, the literature I was reading says it might improve your score by like one or two questions on a standardized test. Is that going to make a difference? Well, maybe if there's some threshold you're trying to meet, but big picture, probably not. Um, so a, a lot of these students who are on college campuses who might feel a desire to try a stimulant to see if that would help them get better, assuming they're not sleep deprived when they're taking their test, probably the stimulants aren't going to do much for them in terms of boosting their performance in the short term. So as someone who has theological training who also practices psychiatry, what are some important things you think we should consider about stimulant use moving forward? One of the things that I found when I was reading about the overlap between uh, ADHD and, and religious literature is uh, the, only, the only statistically uh, significant finding I was able to observe was there, there seems to be more of a tendency among evangelical Christians to dismiss ADHD symptoms and to think that ADHD is not a real condition. And I thought that was very interesting. And it's maybe an opportunity to educate families, to educate clergy about this disorder. Um, now, maybe it gets overprescribed and overtreated. Maybe that's a separate question. But communicating to people that this is, this is a real condition that really affects a person's experience of life. And if there are ways to help, whether through medication or whether through other forms of psychotherapy, for instance, then, then we, we can really work together to see if we can help people to thrive. That brings me um, to my next question. How can the gospel be good news in the context of mental illness, psychiatric medication, and care? My understanding of the Christian message is, uh, over and over again, it says that this world is not, the, is not all there is. And I find that very reassuring, because there are some people who have been born with a vulnerability to a mental illness that, in some ways, they've gotten a bum deal in life. And it's very difficult to go through life with depression or very severe ADHD, or a, a psychotic disorder, or even a substance abuse problem. These, these are things that people are born with these vulnerabilities. And, and sometimes they really struggle in life. To me, I, I think this Christian mes message of hope, that, that there is love available, that there's a community that can support you, that there's hope beyond this life for, for redemption in many forms, 
I, I think that's a really important message that, that, that the gospel can bring into this world of mental health treatment. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's a joy to talk with you, and I appreciate your time with us today. Thanks for having me. For further interviews and other resources on Christian engagements with psychiatric medications, please visit our website, tmc.divinity.duke.edu.